in the latter part of that verse. And the topic tonight is arise and do great exploits. Arise and do great exploits. And the text reads, the latter portion, the people that do know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. You may be seated. I really enjoyed this morning's worship and the song the choir rendered. And this evening was just as phenomenal and the song the choir rendered. And it is not good to sing those kinds of songs when you have a Holy Ghost preacher that might just go on to heaven. I just had to keep myself fastened in my seat and my spirit kept going, mm -mm. and I'm like, you are the preacher, so hold your horse, slacken your riding, because I wanted to take off my shoes and come down into the congregation and have a real, real great time, my hallelujah. Only the redeemed can bless God like that. Only the church that has a relationship with God. We understand that any moment now, God's finest chariots will come and we are ready to go. No crying, no sorrow, just rejoice because I've gone home. Amen? Praise the name of the Lord. Arise and do great exploits is the topic. Now the text lets us know that the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The phrase that do means you actually know him. No pretense and no faking. The prophet Daniel is making a firm, unchangeable declaration that people that do know their God, Christians that do know their God, shall be strong and do exploits. You see, when you do know God, you are not like the old prophet who told the young prophet that he knew God and that God told him to come and dine with him. You are not like the prophets of Ahab who told Jehoshaphat that Jehovah told them that he and Ahab would win the battle. You are not like the Pharisees who said to Jesus that they knew Adonai and that they were keepers of the law, but yet so they plotted to kill the only begotten son of God. You are not like Sennacherib who told King Hezekiah that if he did not surrender to him, he would kill him because Yahweh told him to do that. And so there are many people who mention the name of the Lord and who say they know the Lord, but in truth and in fact, they really don't know the Lord like they say they know him. That's why the scripture is saying that the people, and the word there, the, there, the definite article is qualifying what kind of people, not any and everybody, the people, the people of the Lord, the blood wash, those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, the bride of Christ, the ecclesia, the called out ones, uh, those that are consecrated and separated, the people that do know their God. The phrase, their God conveys the idea of belonging to, ownership, possession. The Bible tells us that the three Hebrew boys said to the king, but our God, or individually, my God is able to deliver. Because there means possession. And if you're going to say that he is your God, that means that there is ownership. God belongs to you. Scripture also tells us that when Thomas saw Jesus with his nail pierced hands and his wounded side, he said in exclamation, my Lord and my God. 
Paul tells us in Hebrews 13, 6, that because the Lord is our helper, he says, because the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man will do unto me. And so we can deduce that if you want to do great exploits, you must be the people that do know their God. Hence, it is clear that if we are going to arise and do great exploits, we must belong to God. You cannot use God's power without belonging to God. You cannot tap into God's power unless God is living on the inside of you. God's power cannot be bought like the devil's power. You can go to certain parts of the world and you can pray a medicine man, a shaman, a priest, a voodoo man, a sorcerer, a conjurer. You can pay him any kind of money in his currency and buy the devil's power from him. But the people that know their God are are the ones that are in possession of the power of God to do great exploits. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 27 reads, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So God wants to be your God as much as he is expecting that you will desire him to be your God. Now the word no means relationship, knowledge, proven, knowing God closely on a one-to-one -one basis. Once you know God, it means you really do know the Lord. You know, the thing I admire about the relationship between Moses and Yahweh was that Moses knew God. The Bible tells us that all of a sudden a plague breaks out in the camp because the people are murmuring and Moses says to the high priest, go get the incense and run through the congregation because Moses understood that when you begin to bless God, when the righteous man begin to worship God, it is going to bring deliverance to the unrighteous because the Bible tells us that by the cleanness of our hands that we he will bring deliverance to a person who is incapable of getting it for himself. So because Moses knew God, he was intimately involved with God. He knew how to get God to change his mind. He knew how to stay God's hand. He knew how to appease God. He knew how to bless God. And he knew how to worship and serve God. So the text tells us that the people that do know their God. And so it qualifies uh, that there's a difference between those who have only heard about God and people who really do know God. The problem that Job had in the beginning is that he had heard of God and he was serving a God that he had heard of. But when he saw God, it was altogether different. And so we've got to move from just hearing about God and coming to the place of knowing God. Because when you do know God, it empowers you to do exploits. Knowing God or having knowledge about God is the foundation upon which we become strong. Believers who are commissioned to arise and do great exploits must be acquainted personally, intimately, and closely with God. And through knowledge about God, they must know with all certainty that his character and his nature is immutable. Because to do great exploits require that you know God. And so one of the things you must know is that God's character and God's nature is immutable. You see, there's a difference between your character and your reputation. Your character is really who you are. Your reputation is what any and everybody wants to say about you. Some people would say you're a son of God today. Tomorrow they will say you're a demon possessed. But your character is who you really are. 
The immutability of God's character and nature means that God never loses his integrity. That is why we are commanded to live a life of integrity as believers. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, he declares, I am the Lord and I change not. It means that he's the same from age to age. In Exodus 3.14, he says to Moses, I am that I am. I exist that I exist. I will continually be, continually be an unchanging God. And so it is important for every believer to know that God will never change who he is. The God you met at the altar many years ago when you gave your heart to Jesus, he will continue to be the same God until the end of time. It means that he will never change from being the same yesterday, today, and forever. You don't want a God that you go into battle for today and he doesn't turn up because he doesn't feel like it. God promises us that he will always be there, that he will never leave us and forsake us. And because his character and his nature is consistent, we can trust God. It means that his, con that his character is consistent. According to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17, it tells us that when God desired to show more convincingly to the ears of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. When God wanted to convince Abraham with absolute certainty or on giving unquestionable proof of his unchangeable character. In other words, Abraham, I am telling you to leave where you are and follow me by faith. God guaranteed it with an oath. Whatever God has asked you to do tonight, you can step out confidently in it. You know, sometimes there are people who leave one job to go to another job. They've been given another position. And then a week within the job, they tell you, we've got to let you go because the contract that we got, which calls us to hire you, has been canceled. And so you have to go. Then you find yourself without a job and without income. Not so with God. When God says, leave all and follow me, you can be sure that there's manna in the wilderness. When God says, forsake all and follow me, you can be sure that he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother or sister. When God says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, you can book and believe it, that there is water that will come from a rock. Wherever God calls, he always make provision. Why God is immutable, He cannot change from who He is from age to age, He is still the same. The immutability of God lets us know that God will never let us down. He said to Joshua in chapter 1, verse 5, I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. The immutability of God lets us know that there's no variableness or shadow of turning in him. He's not double-minded or ever betwixt and between. The prophet Samuel told King Saul after the Lord had rejected him. The glory of Israel will not change his mind for he's not a man that he should change his mind. You may be wondering how is this connecting to great exploits. You see, many people want to fight a bear and a lion without proving and having any knowledge of who God is. That's why Saul hid in his palace and David walked out to Goliath because he had relationship with God. He knew the God that had the power to kill the bear and then a couple days later, he had the power to kill a lion. Now a few days later, he has the power to bring down the giant. Knowing who God is gives you the faith and the confidence to want to rise up and do great exploits for the Lord.
Believers who trust in the integrity of God's character know with absolute certainty that he will never cease to be trustworthy towards them. Why? His word which is exalted above his name assures them that he is good to all. Psalm 145, 9. His compassion fail not. Lamentations 3.22. His understanding is unsearchable. Isaiah 40.28. His mercies endures forever. Psalm 106 verse 1. His faithfulness endures to all generations. Psalm 119 verse 90. He will never take away his love and kindness. Psalm 89.33. His grace is given to us without measures. Romans 12.3. You see, the reason why a prophet will continue to declare the word of God even though he's beaten and put into prison is because he understands that the character of God never changes. God is good all the time. Many want to do great exploits, uh, but in a Rolls Royce. Uh, they want to do great exploits, uh, but in a stadium filled with 10,000 people to their own glory. But the kind of exploits that God is talking about today will require that the people that he is going to enlist to do it have no proof of him and they know him. Because when you find yourself in the valley of the shadow of death, you must know that the immutable character of God has to be right there with you. That God will not let death come and destroy you. You've got to understand uh, when God sends you in the battlefield to do great exploits uh, and the army is more than you are that you have a God that says uh, I am Jehovah Sabaoth. Uh, I am the Lord of the armies of heaven. Many people bow down to demonic manifestation. They tremble and they become fearful when the devil begins to manifest himself because they don't know God. They just hear that he is an almighty God, but they've never proven God. And so it demands that we know that God is unchangeable. He will never change who he is. God is not schizophrenic from everlasting to everlasting. He is God. He does not have double personality. Some people only see God as being good when he's blessing them all the time. But then the same God who is blessing you will pick you up and put you in the fire. Every time you're in the fire, it's not the devil. Sometimes God will try you. All you have to do is look for the fourth man in the fire with you. Because he's Esh Ekola, the God of the fire. So anytime God puts you in fire, just look around and say, where are you, God? You've got to be here because your unchangeable nature is to be present with the righteous at all times. If you are in prison, do like Joseph and look around for God. And when you find the favor of God, that's God say, I am here with you. You might not be able to walk through the doors like the employee but right inside a prison I am going to give you such favor that you can live a life of ease and luxury in your incarceration and you understand that God does not change you must know the character and the nature of God if you want to be a mighty woman of God if you want to be a great man of God if you want to be young and strong like Pastor Vella well then you have to know that God does not change because it takes faith and trust in God to do the things that he does Amen. only repeating Bishop Hebert glory to God Believers who are commissioned to arise and do great exploits must have an existent, vibrant, 
relationship with God and his word. And those of you who were here this morning, you understand the importance uh, of seizing the word of God. There are many people that do not have a relationship with God and his word. That is how God talks to you. Apart from his spirit, he speaks through the word. And you must have an active, excited, vibrant relationship with God. Why? It is very important and vital to your spiritual survival that you know that every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is infallible. Everything that God tells you is free of error and absolutely reliable. You see, God is not a trickster or a schemer like Jacob. God does not hoodwink anybody. He doesn't flim flam anybody. He doesn't do like the three card men and, and you know to try with a sleight of hand to deceive you. Every word that God has spoken to man from his creation has been true from the beginning to the end. Joshua, when he was about to depart, he called all Israel to him and he said, not one of the precious promises that God has made to you has failed. You are living in the land flowing with milk and honey. The reason why many of us are not in possession of the promises of God, because we've accused God of lying. We are accused, we have accused the accurate prophets of God as being liars because we did and want to wait until God was ready to give us what he said he would give us. But if you're going to rise up and do great exploits, if you're going to have the two-edged sword in your mouth, uh, you must believe uh, that the word of God is not a lie. You must believe uh, that everything that God says that he will do by his word, that it shall be done. God does not give his word and take it back like King David. King David had given Mephibosheth everything that had belonged to his father. And then Ziba worked a trick. And David gave the land to Ziba. And then when he found out Ziba was lying, he tried to give it half and half. God, it's not like that. What God has for you it is for you. Before the foundations of the world, uh, what God has for you is for you. I am not bothered when people try to cheat me out of anything because you cannot take away from me what God has for me. And if you got brother not to give me, God will turn around now and tell sister to give me the blessing and to double it because every word of God is true. He's not deceptive like the son who told his father that he would work in the vineyard and didn't. He does not betray our confidence as Judas did. He's not a liar like Ananias and Sapphira. And he never turns back from fulfilling his duty to us as John Mark did. You know what I realize about God? God is faithful to the end. I remember in my youth, as I was struggling to walk this Christian journey because of a number of events that had transpired in my life, God was so merciful to me that even in my backsliding, he never left me. I didn't deserve it, but he never left me. Because before the foundation of the world, did you think I ever thought that I'd be living in America? Did you think that I ever imagined that I would have been evangelist at the Lashley? I thought all of my days I'd be Sister Heather, a good member in the house of God, being a blessing to my pastor and congregation. But in spite of my stumbling and falling, the word that the Lord has spoken of on my life did not return on Unto him void. There's no sin that you can fall that deep down into. You can't fall that far from God that he can't find you. 
There is no darkness that can hide you from the unsearchable eyes of God. Wherever you are, God is always there. And if you are going to do great exploits for God, you must know beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, that God does not lie. John 17, 17 tells us that God speaks the truth uh, at all times. Uh, God's unchangeable nature and his infallible word provide the strongest ground of faith and brings deep consolation. You can trust God at all times, even when it does not make sense. You can trust God. You can trust God. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 6, 17 to 18, that God came to Abraham and begin to make a covenant with a man who was formerly an idolater. Abraham's father was the maker of idols. And God walked into Mesopotamia in the midst of idolatry. That's why it doesn't matter where you are. When I see people have given themselves over to the occult, I rejoice in the fact uh, that one day they're coming out. Uh, and they're coming out with all of Satan's secrets. You see, when Moses was raised, by Pharaoh. He wasn't raised in a Christian house. He was taught all that black magic and white magic and all that kind of stuff. That's why when he met God and God said, go tell him, he said, what is your name? Because the gods in Egypt had names. Moses had already witnessed occult power, but now the God of all power that was coming for Moses to do great exploits. Moses had to know God he had to have an experience with God before he moved out to, to do what God wanted him to do. He had to know his name. He had to prove uh, his character and his nature. And so when Moses got to Pharaoh, it was not a problem to stand and say, listen, I believe God. He's going to release us and there's nothing you can do about it. He said to Abraham, look, I search all over, can't find nobody, nobody greater than me. And he says, I'm going to make an oath and a promise to you now. And so the promise, he pledges faithfulness. Everything I said I would do, a father of many nations. I'm going to give you a son to be an ear of all the blessings. Through you, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. And then the oath is all the infinite perfections of the Godhead. For he swore by himself. The right of Psalm 33, 11 tells us the counsel of the Lord stands forever. If you are going to do anything valiant for the Lord and you are going to be second guessing the word of God. Listen, there's a time to fleece God like Gideon, but there's a season where there's no fleecing required. You've got to begin to walk on water and believe uh, that God is going to cause it to congeal uh, and you're going to walk as Jesus walked. There's a time to fleece God and then there's a time uh, to get up and say, if I perish, I perish, but I'm going to see the king. There's a time in our infancy to fleece God. But when you come into spiritual manhood, you've got to open the window, even though the decree is signed, and begin to bless God as usual. His word is infallible. It doesn't lie. It will come to pass in its seasons. You see, that's why Paul tells us in Romans 4.18 that Abraham hoped against hope. In other words, when Abraham came to the end of all the faith and the trust and reliance and confidence that he could place in God and the promise of his word. And still, the, the things that God said he would do had not come to pass as yet. Abraham made a decision. I am still going to move forward in the integrity of God's word. 
My long is dead. My wife wounds are dead. I don't have any children. Yet still they're going to be like the stars above and the sand of the seashore. And everybody knows he's getting old. It's about time to go. But Abraham knew that there's no word from the mouth of God that will ever return unto him, boy. That the word of God is always infallible. And he went forward in faith, continuing to hope in God. And at the end, he got the promise. You can't do great exploits without knowing God. You know, sometimes God will commission us to go do a thing. And then you find yourself in trouble. Jesus said to the disciples, um, take the boat. I'll meet you over there. I have something to do. And while they're sailing, going along, a storm arose. You see, it was necessary for them to experience the storm. Some people begin to say, well, why would God tell me to do this? And then a storm. You said you want to do great exploits. You said, God, use me. And sometimes God has given you an opportunity to be used. And you begin to give in. And, oh, God, I can tell you, Lord, you are so unjust. You're killing me. Lord, I'm losing 10 pounds. How long I've been asking you for groceries. And you don't understand that in the losing of the weight, God is bringing a better health to you. God is causing you to see like Daniel. Whether you eat or not, you are going to to look good. The people that do know their God, you must know that God will never flip on you. God will never change on you. He is forever the same Jesus. You must know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God does not lie, will not lie, and cannot lie. Every word of God can be trusted to the point of being taken away into captivity. Thrown into the fire, cast into the lion's den, dropped into the miry well, or pursued by relentless enemies. You are running, but you're still declaring, I shall not die, but live to declare the glory of God. You are in hiding, but you're saying, hear my cry, O God. Attend on to my prayer. From the ends of the earth, I am calling out to you. And now that I am overwhelmed, I have come to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me in the past and a strong tower from the enemy. The word of God. Listen to what Psalm 119 verse 160 says. Every word of God is true from the beginning. Matthew 5 says, though the heaven and earth pass away, God's words will not fail. Isaiah says, for as the rain comes down and the snow and does not go back up, so shall my word be that go forth out of my mouth, says the Lord. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. In Jeremiah, the Lord declares, I will hasten my word to perform it. Isaiah declares again, I have sworn by myself, save God, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. Again in Isaiah he says, the Lord will cause righteousness and justice to spring forth before all nations through the self-fulfilling power of his word. If you are going to do great exploits, it's not going to be with nuclear weapons. It's not going to be a new, a new gun, a scud missile, a war tank. It is the word of God, the sword of the spirit. Christians who are commissioned to arise and do great exploits must have proven the omnipotence of God. This means that they have experienced firsthand, like Moses, that he alone is the sole power. He said to Abraham in Genesis 17 verse 1, I am the almighty God. 
In Deuteronomy 32, 29, he declares, I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Second Chronicles 26, Jehoshaphat said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is not their power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee. I have encountered over the years believers who stand before me trembling in their boots. Because sometimes the TV begins to talk and it's not on. Or they're sleeping at night and they hear things moving around. Or people in the kitchen cooking and all that kind of stuff. And they're afraid. They're trembling and they went and tried out all kinds of things first. And then they decide, let me see if God can do anything. And my first question is. Do you believe that God is the almighty God? Yes, evangelist, but every night, and da, 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 I, do you believe that God has all the power? Yes, I do, but I could feel it coming on me and blowing on me. And I'm saying, just calm down, calm down. I understand what you're saying. It is real, it is reality. But listen to my question. Do you believe? That God is the almighty God. Do you know that God made the devil and every demon that is trying to give you trouble? You see, because they come all worked up and overwhelmed, that demons are in their house or in their room and doing this and that, yet still they say that they belong to God and that they know God, but they're literally exasperating because of demonic presence. But when you know God and you have proven your power, you get up out of your bed and you go to where the enemy is and you address the situation in the mighty name of Jesus. Satan in the name of Jesus Christ I bind you and I cast you out of this house. You open windows and doors and you begin to run them out uh, the blood of Jesus. Uh, I plead the war and blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, I plead the speaking blood of Jesus Christ and as soon as you begin to war, the devil says she knows God. He knows God. We can't survive in this house because the people that do know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. We all want to work miracles and to lay hands on the sick. But every sickness is not a natural sickness. It is one thing if you walked out with your shirt off and you caught a cold that made you sick. You lay hands on that and the person is healed. But when the sickness is a demon, it is a different kind of ministry altogether. And so if you have not proven the power of God, you're going to back up. Do, don't you know that there are pastors today that recognize that there are demons in their members? And they allow their members to live demon-possessed? Because the pastors themselves are afraid of doing great exploits? There are many men and women of God that will not touch a demonic manifestation for nothing because they are afraid of a literal encounter with the devil. But they want to prophesy great prophecies. And they want to do what they're determined to be an exploit. But we are called into our army where we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, and the rulers of the darkness of this world. And if you're going to fight spiritual warfare, then you need to know that God is omnipotent. Because if you don't know that, then you are already failing 
in the battle. If you are going to arise and do great exploits, you must have witnessed God's protection from the arrow that flyeth by noonday and the destruction that lays waste at noonday. You must experience a safety from the pestilence that walks in darkness. You must have seen where the wicked dug a pit for you to fall into and God allowed them to fall into the pit after they dug it. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do awesome exploits for God. How are you going to fight for a military and you don't know of its capability? Do you think that Barack sends the military up in Afghanistan or Iraq they call boy guns? Pow, 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 pow. And the terrorist is going da 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 That's how some of us approach the enemy. We run over the word pow, and then we run back out because you're afraid of what he will hit you. It's about time that we face the enemy head on. It's about time that we walk into our battles with all confidence because we know that we are packed with power and we are backed by all heaven. We are backed by the power of the living God. Don't you know that anyone who fights in the army of God never die on the battlefield? Because this supernatural church, Jesus Christ, has given to us all power over the power of the enemy. And so when you live right and you know God and you have relationship with God and you have proven God's power in your own behalf, then you can arise and go forth by the commissioning of God and do great exploits. The psalmist says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in tents of wickedness. When you have ushers that understand the whole concept of doing great exploits, that take up and they, and they take up their position in anointing and power at the door of the Lord, nothing will walk through these doors that is not of God. When the door is open, you have ushers that are filled with the power of God. Their eyes are open. They are discerning. They are able to recognize the enemy when he walks through the door. And before they can move from the foyer to come into the sanctuary, the matter is addressed right there. We've got to move from being so, so, so anxious and eager to get membership that we pull up thorns. We bring in thorns among the wheat and sons of Belial and daughters of Jezebel among the saints of God. We've got to have ushers at the door that are strong, who know God and will do great exploits. Recently I encountered someone who was invited to a teaching that was being done, and I was doing the teaching. And the person said it was a good topic. I was dealing on spiritual warfare. And because the individual has had a lot of chaos in their lives, they felt that I could benefit from this. But I don't know what they were expecting to hear. And so in Beginning to teach on spiritual warfare, the first thing the Lord instructed me to do was to identify the enemy, his name, his origin, and his capabilities. So I began to talk about Lucifer, and he was the anointed cherub, and I started to come down, and I started to declare in my preaching, you know, the might and the power and the greatness of God. Now, remember, this person is supposed to be a believer that is sitting there, that has come to gather knowledge that she may have victory over the enemy. 
And then suddenly the demon inside the lady began to look out at me. That woman began to look at me with eyes like razor blades. The eyes came down small, you know, when you're zeroing on the enemy, you're taking a picture and you're zeroing in. I'm declaring who God is and he's the almighty God and there's none like him and the devil this doesn't have this and he doesn't have that. And oh my God, the demon is mad. And she sat there. Don't you know, when that lady left there, she went home. And she put down some prayer for me in the spirit realm for my demise that my opportunities to minister would be shut down. The woman went home and declared war on me because I exposed who the devil was. And when I got up, the Lord said to me, the things that I give you are for my people. I do not want you sharing my secrets with the sons and daughters of Belial. And I made it known. I cannot tell you who to bring, but I cannot continue if these are the people that are going to be coming in. Because the devil wants the inside scoop as to how God works, that he will know how to destroy the church. But God is wiser than the devil. You see, if I wasn't strong in the Lord, if I hadn't proven the power of God, when she began to look at me, I would have compromised the gospel and I would have started to say something else. But when I saw the enemy looking, I began to declare in the hearing of his ear that my God made you and my God gave Give me power over you. And because I have the spirit of the living God living on the inside of me, I outrank every demon. I outrank every devil because it is not by might uh, nor by power, but by the spirit of the living God that we do great exploits. They're coming into the house of God. And they want to weaken and intimidate the righteous. And the devil is bold enough to look at you eyeball to eyeball. Look back at him and let him know I have proven the power of God. The word is infallible. God is immutable. And there's nothing you can do about it. He is sovereign Lord. He can do as he pleases. One thing I've recognized with many preachers in America, they leave and they go to various African states to minister. And they're leaving with this kind of entertainment gospel because they tend to think that because a nation might not be as academically literate as they are, that spiritually they are that illiterate. And you walk into nations that are steep in the occult. They are deemed the people who have strongest demonic power than some believers are exercising, and it should not be so. And they're going down to cast out demons, arc demons that they're not equipped to because they have not proven God's power. You think when Moses stood in Pharaoh's court that it was only two or ten? All of hell was present in Pharaoh's court. There were hundreds of musicians and sorcerers and diviners. Pharaoh himself was the chief voodoo man of Egypt. They had all the books uh, with all the spells and the curses. And and everybody was calling on some kind of God to arise and demonstrate his power against Moses and Aaron. But they stood there because the people that do know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. And after every man had done all he could do, then Moses' serpent ate everything up. It tells us that God is in charge. God is in control. And we will have the victory over the enemy every time. We were never made to run away from the enemy. We were made to go after the enemy. And if the enemy left where he lived to come to trouble you without cause, we were made to send him back home penniless 
and take all his gods and throw them in the fire. These are the people that God is looking for. God wants the church to really know him. We are living in an era where the devil is educating those that have given him an ear. You hear me? Lots of people you see out there in this new age thing and that they're making millions of dollars and overnight stardom and notoriety. They have co covenants with hell for greatness and prosperity and their eyes are blind. But God is commanding the church to rise up and do great exploits. The greatest exploit that can ever be done in the earth is the saving of the souls of men. Leave the miracles for God, but our exploits is to walk out there and tell a man, receive Jesus Christ, and he doesn't see anyone physically coming into his life, but like you, he can testify that there is change. Believers who can testify to the immutability of God's character, the infallibility of his word, and who have proven his omnipotence are the ones who are strong in the day of terror, in the day of battle, calamity, and distress. When you have proven God, you stay steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you'll know that your labor it's not in vain. If when you were doing church in Jamaica, they lied on you. And God deliver you out of that. When you come to America, you don't fall down because somebody lie on you. Because you have proven God to be a vindicator already. You now become strong and you say to yourself, this is not the first time someone has lied on me. I am going to let God show forth my righteousness. Psalm 21, 27 verse 1 declares, the Lord is the strength of my life. The mother of Jesus was strengthened by God to see her son flogged and crucified. We are talking about and you've proven God. Mary had proven God. How can this thing be? And Gabriel told her. And she said, be it unto me according to your word. And she stood there. And she watched everything her son went through. But you know that God is unchangeable. But you know that God is forever good. Are you hearing me? His compassion fail not. Morning by morning new mercies you see. God, the infallibility of God's word and the immutability of God's character cannot be really dissected because they are so intertwined. When you talk about his word is error free, it is the same as saying he change if not. When you've proven God's power. You can stand in the day of trouble. When Nehemiah was going through, he said to the people, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because he had proven God in his journey, all the beatings and all the floggings. God is looking for a strong set of people who would arise and do great exploits. Believers who can testify to the immutability of God's character, the infallibility of his word, who have proven his power and have become strong, are the ones the Lord is commanding to rise up and do great exploits for his glory. Everyone does not qualify within a season to rise up and to do great exploits. Notice it says, when you can testify that he's God and he changes not. When you know that there's no lie in the word of God. When you have proven God's power, and you now become strong. Then you can arise and do great exploits. Several years ago in another state, a young man wanted to beat me in church. 
I was working in the office. And I said, Lord, he like he thinks that I live in America alone. Because he doesn't see family. He really thinks that he can just beat me like that. So I said, he forget that I serve you for real, real. Oh, yes, I'm 100% in this. So I said to the Lord, anoint me like Samson, please. Oh, yes. Anoint me like Samson. I know in my strength I can't beat him. So I need another power. Anoint me like Samson and I position my spirit. Because I can beat him to the end of the Holy Ghost. Every time I give him one, it will be in the name of Jesus. That you may know that he is God and I am his servant. Because the people that know their God, I'm talking about having strength and confidence in God. I believe Samson was a strong man. And since he changes not, he can raise up some Samsons among us. And God went all the way to my friend's job and he says, begin to pray. He says, Heather, the guy wants to be Heather and she's ready to fight, call the battle off. So she became the intercessor and God diffused it. What I'm saying is, when you've proven God, when you know God, and the gunman come up to you, you don't start to cry and holler for blue murder. You begin to call upon that demon of murder. I command you to come out now in the name of Jesus. You begin to take authority over everything that is coming at you because you understand that God has given you the power over everything that the enemy will try to do to the redeemed. That's why Queen Esther could get up and say, if I perish, I perish. I will see the king. You know why? She looked back at Joshua stopping the sun. The parting of the Red Sea. She looked back at all that God had done for King David. She realized that there's no error with God. So I can risk my life for the people of God. My purpose and my destiny is to be a deliverer for my people. And she rose up. After praying fasting, and she did great exploits, she never held a sword in her hand. But she knew how to get the job done. Because whenever you bring it down in the supernatural realm, it will fall flat in the physical realm. You see, we only think that great exploits is sending a rocket to the moon. Or you having a weapon, so to speak, that is better than someone else. But God is the one who decides what weapon you would use. Three days of praying and fasting. And she prayed the word of God. And God brought down the enemy. The Bible tells us about King Jotham. He was a godly king. And God was so much with King Jotham. That the surrounding nations courted his friendship for fear of what God, Jotham's God, would do to them if they became his enemy. Don't you think it's about time the world become afraid of the church rather than the Obia man? Don't you think it's about time that the Santeria worker on your job become afraid of you more so than you being scared of what she put underneath your desk to get you fired? Because we have to come to the place of knowing God and proving God's power so that we can defy every uncircumcised Philistine. Look at Deborah. A woman in a man's world leading a nation. Great exploits. She led them in paths of righteousness as a spiritual leader. The greatest thing any pastor, any teacher, anyone who has a number of people under his leadership, the greatest exploit that that individual can do is to teach you the word of God. Because when the word of God is in you, then you can defend yourself. Look at Micah the prophet. Oh, he did great exploits. He stood before king. 
and he declared the word of the Lord. It cost him prison, but he did what God wanted him to do. God is saying, when you know that I don't change, and when you trust my word, you've proven my power, and you've come to the place of spiritual maturity and strength, then you qualify to do great exploits for me. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do great exploits for the Lord. And if we intend to do great exploits, it means that we have to improve our relationship. We have to draw nearer to God. We have to spend time with God. And how do you get to know God? Not by watching the bold and the beautiful. Not by law and order. Not by any secular programming. But spending time in his word and in his presence. How do you become strong? By adversity. You become strong when God takes you out of one kind of fire, then he puts you into another. How do you become strong when your faith is tested? There's no job or no money and rent is due. There's no food, but children are to be fed. These are the things that cause us to see the hand of God move for us. Sometimes God gives you an appointment and no message. And you brace the pulpit and they call you all kinds of great words and you're wondering, Lord, what can I say to your people? And as you open your mouth, he begins to fill it. That's a great exploit right there. Because they know, you know that God is not going to embarrass you in the pulpit. You know that, that, that God knows that you come out of obedience. You know the Spirit is saying, yes, I want you to go. But he hasn't said to you what he wants you to say. There's so many ways in which we get to do great exploits. But the exploits comes after. You know that God's character and nature is consistent. That he will never change and he will not fail you. That his word is true from the beginning. He's not a man that he shall lie. After you've proven God have done something for you. That's why people don't like to go to trainee doctors. Who have you ever done this to? Nobody. Well, I'm not a guinea pig. You're not touching me. God isn't looking to send forth guinea pigs and rookies to do the job of a son of God or a woman of God. He's looking for those that know him, that know him, that have proven him. He's looking for those that trust him, those that are willing, like Peter, to say, bid me come and begin to walk on water. Do you want to do something great for God? It demands that you know him, that you trust him, that you prove him, and you become strong. Stand with me, please, in the presence of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The people that do know their God. I know that, if not all of you, most of you are born again. And you've had an encounter with God. But do you know him in the sense that God wants you to know him tonight? Because he's looking for more people to rise up and do great exploits. He's not talking about just knowing that his name is Jesus. And there's an Abba Father and the Holy Spirit. He's talking about a real 
deep-rooted relationship that there's nothing that can destroy your faith. Nothing that will cause you to quit. It doesn't matter how hard life gets because you know God. You will stand. If you want your faith to increase or you want to become solidified in God, I want you to come. I want you to come and let me pray over you. If you want God's